What you have to start with is what's the foundation of this city. We got great trails, we got great schools, we, you know, and everything. You got the University of Arkansas. You suddenly realize after you've been here a while, it's not what you're marketing here, it's what you believe. And what's great about this city is that we believe in one another and it's community, building community, and it's everybody helping everybody else. And I believe in an open door. And when we talk about an open door, I, I mean that everybody should be accepted, no matter what the color of their skin or their religious belief, what country they come from or who they love. People have to realize that homeless people are citizens too. And they should be helped in the community like everybody else. If we truly believe in, we truly believe that everybody's accepted, then we have to help homeless folks like we help everybody else. Well, the McKinney-Vento statute, federal government law, defines homelessness uh, as someone that lacks fixed, regular, adequate housing, shelter. So obviously, in layman's term, it just means somebody doesn't have a roof over their head. Uh, I've talked to some guys about, hey, what does the word home mean to you? What's, what's home? And they'll describe their campsite with the people that matter to them and the place where their stuff is stored. And, and so, you know, they've got a home, but they don't have a house. In the past, if you ever thought of a homeless individual, you, you know, you think of the old man sleeping in a box on the side of the road. Thank God I got a house. I mean, look at you. It's, it's, it's a roomy two bedroom. You know what I mean? It's got a bedroom over there, bedroom over here. Probably warm, Pretty nice. though. Oh, yeah, it's warm and dry. Yeah, it's, I'm, I really am proud of my home. When I moved here, you had the same type of individuals. They were in their 50s and 60s. Now, it's not uncommon to see juveniles and teenagers in their 20s living in the woods. I believe there's a growth uh, due to the fact that the information has gotten out to many individuals about the compassion that Fayetteville offers. And when people hear the, about this passion, they want to come and experience it. And with that, when you have our churches also providing support to those that are without homes, I think that where it gets around and people would like to come here, and even if they come from within or without outside the state, they find that the support is here. One time, any wooded area, a lot of the wooded areas, there was usually someone in the woods camping there, but since Fayville has cleaned out, you know, they've cleared out all the underbrush. The majority live on 19th Street now, uh, 19th and School. That is a, where we have a homeless camp in the wooded area out there. And it's also near Seven Hills Day Center. And of course, this is all university property. It's possibly driving a 
silver Honda Accord. Arkansas. And this is a part that's kind of concerning when you see children's toys out here. You know, we've had kids out here before, but this just makes me wonder if we got some more kids out here that we have to have to uh, speak with. What's going on, guys? Not much, bud. You all right? Yeah, you. What are you guys doing? Yeah, moving. moving? Uh, I was trying to get over here to clean up all that mess and throw half of that shit out. These guys are videoing here, doing a documentary. How you doing? So. How you doing? How are you guys? Good. Weren't you living over here? You were trying to, weren't you? Yeah, she got a bigger tent. That one was too small. So where are you moving at now? Oh, you're over there? Is that your nice bed over there? Uh, yeah, I just got that. You know anybody who wants it? He wants it, but he'll, he usually falls asleep and passes out. I'll sell it for five bucks. Five bucks, huh? That's a deal. This is Kim Blanchett. I'm Shane. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We've known Kim for a while. She's yeah. she's helped us with some investigations out here. And I don't know how long you been out here. I've been out here off and on for seven years. Seven. Okay. As you can see, this is her her home. But she's, she says she's sleeping in the car now because she don't feel safe with everyone walking around. It's always at nighttime it starts to get the weirdest around here. During the day, it's pretty quiet. You ain't got no bob wire we're gonna trip on today, do you? No, I don't have it set up today. Good. Okay. <laughs> I don't wanna get hurt. I don't got it set up today. <laughs> no booby trap. No booby trapper. We'll Not today. <laughs> I set up bob wire along the walkways because at nighttime it gets scary. You never know who's gonna like creep up on you in your tent. Being a girl out here on your own. Yeah, that's, it that's gets pretty right. scary sometimes. So they have to trip over the bob wire before they get to the tent. <laughs> I like to come out and talk to them and get to know them. Um, sometimes they want to talk, sometimes they don't. But yeah, you want to come out and let them know that you're you're not out here doing force on them, and you know we do want to help them. As you can see, a lot of them are. There's a reason some of them are scared at night. And we've come across that several times. Individuals who on methamphetamine, they just walk around the woods at night and stealing things. And even, even amongst the homeless, they're, they're scared. From the elderly all the way down to children. I mean, I mean you have narcotic users, mental illness, alcohol abuse. I mean, you pretty much get a wide variety of people. It was a couple. Erica is actually Eric. He's transgender. He's going through the process at this time. And they moved out here. They had some family issues. Uh, family wouldn't accept them, so they moved out here. And Anybody home? Erica. They're not home. At the very beginning, we were homeless behind Lowe's on Martin Luther King, MLK. So, Sixth Street, some people. But from there, we were actually a pretty good, decent setup. We had a 14 by 14 tent. I'm trying to make it as homey as possible for she built my us wife. A teepee. I built the teepee, <laughs> yeah. We always had some type of hole dug to go to the bathroom because we couldn't really do it. Sometimes we went to the store, they were shut, they didn't want us in there because what we were doing was using the bathroom. Other times it was because they were closed. But Lowe's then, at that point in time, was letting us get water. 
so that was helpful. Can't really get water here where we're at now, on 19th Street. It's a little harder to get water now, so especially with the park being closed and Seven Hills outside water faucet being closed because it's was broken, it was always leaking, so they put a lock on that so no one could use it anymore. We've both been having a really hard time trying to stay warm, especially with it being below zero. That's why I put up the other tarps around that to make it to where it's more insulated, to where the wind doesn't go in. Gap, like really big gaps, like maybe six inches, so the windows are showing and the wind's blowing in. So I had no choice, I had to do that because it was really cold inside. It's easier to get sick out here than it is in an apartment. Because what do you got to do in an apartment? Turn up the thermostat or lower it or whatever. Here, we just have to deal. This is our storage that we have everything inside that we can't fit in there. There's a lot of stuff in there right now. It's extremely messy. But it's a good thing that I, I guess my wife has a hoarding problem with clothing and stuff. I guess it keeps us warmer. It's a shower tent. Some stuff has been coming out of the tent, so it's not a bigger deal. There's an ice chest in there. It's a shower tent for when it's ever uh, warmer in there and all that. So more bottles that came out. I usually try to put some of them, the newer ones right there. And umbrella, we can grab and go whenever we need to. Firewood, whenever we bring out our little grill. Sometimes I have to cook a hamburger, sometimes not. Beds over here in this area. Oh, wow, it's, you got it pretty big in here. Our medications for my transition and also to help her lose weight. Got milk in here, still frozen solid, I think. Yep, the ice is starting to thaw out. Apples are frozen, cheese. Survival so knife to help out with everything. The propane stove's over here. Hemi's, uh, bigger cages over there. We put birds underneath these at night. This one and this one. That's close to her wheelchair. Sometimes we like to jam. Big old speaker. But our food's all good and everything, so that's it. Seven Hills also has these programs that, that will help the homeless get into a place. It's kind of like HUD housing, only they go through Seven Hills. They have a clothing room, which is open from certain times. Um, they have a uh, pantry, which they give you food. Um, it varies on whether you're housed or you're camping. Um, they also have uh, supplemental bags and then campers bags. And then there's housed food. What's the um, difference between a supplemental bag and a camper's bag? A supplemental bag, is, it's only enough to sustain you until you get your actual bag. Um, they don't put very much in it. Um, it's actually mostly junk food like because donuts. that's what people donate. Donuts, cakes, candy, stuff like that. It's kind of bad, but they do have the, the healthy stuff, milk, eggs. Um, they have a lot of bread that actually goes bad really fast. Um, they have... Uh, vitamins, Dayquil and stuff in the medicine cabinet in the front desk office. And then they have, um, we have snack every day at two. And then um, lunch on Friday at 11.30, which is actually really good for us because if we, you, if we can manage it and be able to get up early enough, we can actually eat lunch that day. <laughs> Well, we serve about 100 to 110 people at the day center every day. And it's about 500 people every month, unique visitors. Um, and well, I'm in and out all day long. So yeah, I probably see a good half of those 100 people every day at the day center. Watch this. Right there, it's on there. I'm like, Maybe they did think Fayetteville's the place I'm going to get a better job. I read it in the newspaper. They've got tons of jobs and there's a future there. That's for me. They get here, 
the job works out or it falls through, or maybe they get the job, but the cost of living is higher than they thought it was gonna be. And so, so they end up living in a car or they end up temporarily homeless. That person probably just needs a little bit of support. We've had people come and take a shower at Seven Hills, get on the computer, use the job board to find employment, use the food pantry, you know, the basic stuff. And in a couple weeks, they come back and tell us, hey, I got something that worked out. I saved up, I've got my place, um, put the deposit down, I'm moving into a house. Like they just needed that much. In Northwest Arkansas, we have a shared by name list of people that are chronically homeless. So this is maybe a year or more or multiple episodes of homelessness in, in the last few years. We have a list and it has more than 200 names on it. And so when we have openings in a housing program, like Seven Hills has one housing program, City of Fayetteville has a housing program, Havenwood is a housing program in Bentonville. When there's an opening, we, we look at that list and we try to prioritize who's the most vulnerable, who's the most in need, that would match the opening we have in that program. And you know, clearly we don't have 200 openings and we've got at least 200 names. The Seven Hills apartment complex has uh, 27. Eight of those are permanent homes for people that have disabilities and have been chronically homeless. Uh, the other 19 are transitional, so you, you can only stay there for 12 months or maybe 24 months. The biggest challenges for getting someone housed, one of the challenges is of finding landlords that will work with individuals that have a checkered past. So it might be they have a criminal background uh, issue. It might be they have a credit problem in their background. Uh, you know, someone that's homeless is going to have a mixed bag. Is you know, their story is a mixed bag, and so finding some second chance landlords that will give someone that second opportunity. We did some surveys on that question. What's the hardest thing in your day-to-day -day life? Um, hygiene, getting access to ways to you know get clean and, and take care of yourself, uh, and clothing, and you know, getting clean clothes, new clothes. Um, it's tough living out in the woods or under a bridge. Um, and so getting, taking showers and, and uh, getting clothes is what most people who are homeless say is kind of the biggest struggle getting through the day. The way we organize life together has got to change so that, um, so that we don't have people living in third world conditions in, a, in the world's wealthiest country. So that anger is, is one of the things that uh, does bring me to this kind of work. Of the people that participate in a, in a rapid rehousing program, like our veteran services program, generally the success rate is like 80%, 90%. Really high success rate. It begins with identifying people for whom you know that's the appropriate support. So if you move the wrong people into a short-term housing program, you're not gonna see success numbers. You're gonna see a bunch of people move in and then fail because they needed longer-term support. They needed mental health support. They needed addiction and recovery support. And maybe that takes a lot longer than six or nine months. But if you are identifying and matching the right kind of person to a rapid rehousing program, then yeah, you see you know, 80, 90% success rate of those, those people have leases in their names. They've got their jobs. Uh, stable, they've got their money management skills improved, like their, their future is changed, their future is, you know, positive. Um, I spent about three years or plus outside in the tent. Wow. And so uh, moving into Seven Hills, I know it was a major transition. Uh, what were the challenges that you'd say you had as you were trying to transition into? Um, you know, here? just the familiarity of being outside, you know, I mean, you spend that much time outside and there's all the sounds. Um, and smells that you have of living in the woods and when they're kind of gone, you know, instantly, yeah. it seems like, I mean, it's a little bit of, um, a little claustrophobia and almost a little paranoia because you're just not used to the environment. The first two months were very scary. Um, the quiet was very unnerving. Um, I spent three and a half years with nature around me and a thin layer of, you know, polyester between me and the world and anything that wanted to, you know, invade. Um, 
in your daily life is um, in Fayetteville, is, it's hard because, I mean, it's, it's easy to get your food. You, you won't starve in Fayetteville. Um, there's clothing, there's food. Um, but there's the stigma of walking around South Fayetteville with a backpack and everybody looking at you like you're scum. You're, you know, what are you? What kind of piece of shit are you? Because you're living in a tent or you're homeless. Um, you know, I was a father, I was a teacher, I was a Marine, and I'm a good person. Don't look at me like that. You don't know my story. You know, I, to this day, I, I'm not on my feet. You know, yes, I'm clean. Yes, I have, um, you know, some income. Um, I have a roof over my head, but I'm not functioning. I'm not fully functioning the way I can be. Um, and a lot of that is my mental health um, is not up to, up to par to the point where I can feel comfortable enough with taking that step and putting all this behind me. This is the new girl. New girl? Yep, it's the girl. Hey, sweetie. The girl passes out forever, and then a new one takes the role for a little bit. Never takes the place, just always takes the role. Honestly, the last three days, we have not been getting very much sleep. How can you exactly, when you get an apartment, being homeless for almost a whole, no, it was a whole year. Over a year, a year and a half. We huh? left in, around in yeah. April, no March. So it was before April. Yeah, a whole entire year this time around. We've never actually been homeless this long at one time, usually off and on. Hmm. Well, anyways, after a whole entire year of being homeless and finally getting an apartment, I guess you could say it's really exciting. I just hate moving. The apartment, the new apartment, one we just got yesterday. Chestnut too, four hundred dollars, even for five hundred and forty square feet. I think that hope is that magical ingredient in someone that keeps them uh, engaged, that keeps them able to put up with the tough stuff. And being homeless is really tough. Being able to put up with the disrespect that they <laughs> feel they experience sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, put up with the hard work it takes to change something. If you're living in the woods and you're trying to try to move into a house, there's a hundred steps in between point A and point B. If, if you're trying to change something as important as you know, a substance use addiction that you have, and you know that's the thing in the way of me having a better future, you can't just wake up tomorrow and, and have the willpower to get over that. Like, you have to have something deep within you that says, like, I, I believe this can happen. Like, I see some, some positive light at the end of the tunnel. So that's, I think hope is that, like, magical ingredient. And you can help cultivate it in someone. Like, remind them of the good things. Remind them of things they can take credit for. You know, remember what things were like three months ago? And look what you did. Like, take credit for that. And the next three months can look different if you, you know, do A, B, and C. So kind of help nudging people forward. That's what I think hope is. And, like, we were saying that, that everyone that works at Seven Hills, I hope that we view ourselves as ambassadors of hope to be able to keep that alive in people's life and keep, let them know that tomorrow could be better. I love you, crazy. I really do.
Fayetteville is a pretty chill city. I've lived here for almost four years and I'm originally from the Little Rock area. I'm a journalist, that's what I got my undergrad in. But I'm sticking around to get my masters and I wanted to learn about how documentaries were made. So, I enrolled in documentary production. I was tasked with creating a film with Paulina, who I met in class. I always wanted to be a filmmaker, so I traveled from Poland to the United States to fulfill my dream. My journey to filmmaking took me to the University of Arkansas. In the documentary production class, I work with Andrew. In our documentary class, we were assigned a specific topic, homelessness in Northwest Arkansas. We believe that story of one person can touch more lives than a thousand statistics could ever show, and we wanted to find a story that powerful. So, we started looking for our perfect character. We did a few unsuccessful interviews, but it wasn't really coming together until one day. In just a few seconds, we knew he was our character. We weren't sure why, but we both knew. We hadn't met someone like him before, and we wanted to know how he got here. My name is Clinton Albright, and I am homeless. Fayetteville was the number three city in the United States to live, so I was like, that's where I'm going, and just so happened my friend was living here at the time. So I knew when I got off the bus there I'd be homeless, I wouldn't have anywhere to go, so I was just like, you know, I'll take a chance on it. I'm not the same person I was in October when I got here, you know. Uh, I don't look at things the same way, you know. It gave me a different perspective on, on life and just how, to, how I look at people, you know, whether they're the homeless drunk bum or a dope fiend, you know, there's still some good you can find in those people, you know, as to see that they, you know, they're, they're dope heads who took me in and brought me to my tent. They bang dope, barely have any teeth, you know, but they're good people at the heart. Especially for yeah. letting people, you know, stay out there, man. Yeah. Yeah. Clinton wanted to show us the homeless come where he was staying. Oh, I mean, I'm from Colorado, but I always had some heat, man. Yeah. We were shocked that a homeless camp could be set up in the middle of a college town, like Fayetteville. I stay real close in the area. I got to be by all food. I'm a hungry guy. <laughs> I am, man. I'm growing. Gotta go through some hard stuff to get back here. <laughs> but from now on, you know, we're good now. We just walk through the trail. As you'll see, you'll see going through, we have different, you know, different people set up here as well. The landlord lives back there. <laughs> we got a landlord. <laughs> Sick, right? <laughs> yeah. People, you know, but we're not, they're not supposed to be back here. It's like trespassing, but, you know, not too many people are worried about it. There's, a, there's like a front way to come in and a back way. That's the front way, the tunnel. Um, uh, and the back way, we have to like cut over a lake and shit. I'm not a fan of it. So yeah, these are uh, these, uh, these uh, trees we use for firewood all the time, especially when it's super cold out here. Now, you gonna see this area? Dirt, completely. You see it coming up on it. People here, they're dumpster divers. So yeah, they uh, they like take everything out of a dumpster and keep it. Yeah, dumpster divers. It's weird. So here's my camp. I'll show you guys my tent. It was given to me, of course. I didn't uh, I didn't uh, have one. This is where I lay my head at at night. You know, whenever it's not too cold to be out here. 
uh, my door is broke, so my door doesn't work anymore. But we make do. We definitely make do. Uh, so, yep, that's my living situation. I got my shoes over there. Had a little shoe rack set up, but didn't work too well. Uh, but, yep, I got all my clothes in here and, like, my bag. And my duffel bag. Oh. That's in here. Yeah. Got all my clothes here. So, it's kind of, you know, it's not the best, but it's better than sleeping outside or, you know, at someone's at a church or just some random location where you can get trespassed on but whenever it's cold i go to if the sally does have the cold weather shelter open which is usually my first to go to when it's getting like 30 degrees they open at 34 and below so that's usually my first go to but if they're not open which they don't do sometimes i usually start a fire here and uh, i kind of like tarp it off in order for the smoke to keep going into my tent for the warmth so like is it I mean, I know like everybody, because I know me, I'm from Little Rock. You know of course, I mean? like, big so, city. Yeah, it's kind of, I mean, bigger than bigger this. Bigger than this, yeah. But it's like, everybody's got that thing where it's like, man, like, I'm eventually I'm going to come home, you know what I mean? Of course. Like, eventually I'm going to be here. Of course. Like, do you ever think about that type of stuff? And like, nowadays, it's just like, oh, it's kind of sad that like. It's just sad that, you know, I, I, I knew, I knew everybody in Charlotte. I've grown up, I lived there on and off about 16 years, back and forth from there to Colorado and other places. Um, so it is my home, you know, it's where I call home, uh, you know, I wouldn't rather be any other place, but, you know, I know if I, if I go back there, when I go back there, I will have an issue, you know. I didn't think this young, educated guy could be homeless. That guy could have been me. He could have been anybody. But we started to understand why he became homeless. Maybe he wasn't so perfect. Maybe he was a victim of his own actions. I made bad decisions. I made bad decisions, you know, mm -hmm. that put me here. So it humbled me. I've, I've never worked in my life. You know, I never, my dad gave me everything, my mom gave me everything. So, you know, this here is just like the craziest experience I've ever had to deal with in my life, you know. So being able to persevere through it it that man it just means so much to me because you know i never thought i'd be able to be here for one or be able to you know endure it i smoke weed every day that's just something i've done since i was like every day of my life since i was 14. every day of my life literally for like the past 10 years hanging with the wrong crowd um doing the wrong thing as far as i said you know i was selling pot for two three years you know i was, I wasn't selling i was distributing pot i wasn't selling pot I was distributing it, you know, I sold about 15 pounds a month, yeah, got involved with the wrong people, I just, you know, I didn't, I just talked bad to people, you know, I was just really a bad person, you know, it gave me a different outlook on life when I was doing it, and, you know, the decisions of doing that led me to getting robbed and being, you know, tied up and beaten, and, you know, my mom was tired of hearing that, I was supposed to have stopped doing that long ago, you know, and, she just, she was done with it. She didn't want to put up with it anymore. So she was like, you know, you got to go. I burned a lot of bridges with my family, even though, you know, I've given them money, I've given them shirt off my back, but I've done a lot more deceitful things to them. So my brother was like, no, you can't come stay with me. And I was like, I have nowhere to go. I'm taking everything I had away from me like that. Five minutes is all it took. Yeah, lost everything. But Clinton could put the camp and his mistakes behind him. He was applying for housing, and it appeared he'd get a second chance. This story was pretty much writing itself. A homeless person made some mistakes, got back up again, and is trying to do better in his life. And the fact that it was happening right in front of our eyes was incredible.
do your responsibilities um, daily. Make sure you're taking a bath. <laughs> Take a bath. Use your deodorant. That kind of thing. I um, definitely will be taking a bath every day. I can't we wait. I grew up watching my dad hit my mom, and then when I was like 22, me and my dad finally fought, and now we love each other so much. That's good. It was just, you know, I held a lot of anger towards him because he left my mom and left me, you know. I don't even know what I would do if I found my real dad. <laughs> Oh, that's I look. Even tell you. My brother never met his father, and one day he was like 15. My mom took him to meet him. It's awesome. I mean, I, I talked to him on Facebook, but I've never met the dude in person. So that one out as well. All uh, right. Okay. Clinton, Adamson. I'm trying to coordinate something with my husband, so I apologize. Oh no, ma'am, that's sweet. <laughs> it's nothing like being married. Uh, well, I guess. I currently reside at the Woods. I do. Yeah, I do. I do accept you to run me. I mean, as long as they don't send me another message saying that they're down here. Albright, applicant signature. Uh, 12, 5, 7, 2, 17. I've got all your paperwork already, and therefore, you know, all I've got to do is say, Congratulations, here's your key. Let's go. So, Tiffany's yeah. about to cry. <laughs> oh, no, man. So much better than being outside. So long. Awesome. Awesome. So, I'll see you in a week. I hope so. Oh, you will. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, you see me every day. So. Uh, thank you, Miss Lisa. You're welcome, guys. I will definitely call my mother and let her know. She'll sing praises, you know. Me making my mother stress hurts me, so me being able to ease her mind, whether that's getting housing or giving her money to help her, that's just a blessing all in its own. Hello? Hey. Hey. What you doing? Nothing. What, what's, what's going on? Guess what? What? I got my apartment. Yay! Yeah, girl, that's what I said, Ma. Congratulations. Thank you, baby. Yeah, you got your keys. I'm excited for you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you, baby. Thank you. I'm super happy about it. Good. Yeah, it's snowing here now. What? It, oh, that snow? Man, if you want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, okay. girl. You work tonight, right? Yeah, 3 to 11. Well, just call me on one of your breaks. All right, I love you. Love you too, son. Bye. Bye. Yeah! Oh. <laughs> Boom! Oh. Oh! It's cold as a bitch. Came in, took the peak test, got my key, and celebration from there it was a long you know different experience you know having to having to wait on that you know and being you know in the situation i was it was definitely you know learn a learning experience for me uh but it's a it's a, something i can't really describe as far as how it made me feel you know to to make it to a place where i've been wanting to go you know to to make it out of the situation that i didn't want to be in you know and getting to a place to where i can have some some bit of comfort comfort comfortability where i'm at and i got my dresser here you like that nothing's in there it's supposed to be for clothes i'll fill it up later i left my covers pillow anything that was in there beside my clothes didn't want it to come with me i don't want anything reminding me of it because i have all the reminder that i have in my head you know so i don't want i didn't want to bring anything from there here with me because it just yeah it showed me where i came from but i already know that you know and i'm trying to progress to be able to get further away from that I'm still trying to figure out, you know, me, uh, different ways for me to uh, move forward in my career, you know, as a business, as a business student. Um, I want to pursue more school. I want to try and get an MBA, um, hopefully make me some money, <laughs> hopefully. Um, but for right now, just taking it day by day, just trying to, you know, set myself up, not move too quickly, think everything through, kind of be a little meticulously, 
try to be more meticulous with the things that I do instead of just boom, just shooting right in them. This is Betsy the Blue Scooty. Uh, got her for a hundred bucks for some from some old guy off Let Go. Uh, she gets me where I gotta go from A all the way to Z, back to double alpha. Uh, she goes about 40. Ladies, if you see me, give me a toot, give me a honk. Toot toot. <laughs> I'm sorry, the person you are trying to reach has a voicemail box that has not been set up yet. Please try your call again later. Clinton, pick up the phone. Come on. You're not going to believe what I have right here. What do you have? I could tell you, but I'm just going to show you. Okay. side of things. So we got in touch with Clinton's public defender, Matt Bender. I don't know what's going to happen to Clinton. Clinton has to deal with a supervised probation in the federal system. He will probably have a, a bond or a detention hearing pretty quickly from a federal magistrate. He may be released because his offense isn't super bad. I mean, possession of marijuana. I, I don't. I don't think that that's something a lot of people want to see someone go to prison for. Possession of marijuana might not seem so bad, but Clinton's been caught with much more. In fact, we discovered that in 2015 he was arrested in Marion County, Alabama. Officers found a half pound of marijuana, cash, pills, guns, and drug paraphernalia. After he was released, he thought he was past it. But he didn't complete everything required, so the county put a halt on him when he was released. He's in a vulnerable situation. He's going to be a, a young black guy in the federal system in, in Alabama under a federal Department of Justice that is now instructed to try to seek the, the harshest penalty they can in every single case. I mean, Clinton's an individual, right? Like, yeah, he's different in a lot of ways, but his story is not unique at all. What's happened to him is not unique. I think that it's, it's reflective of a lot of people's circumstances and a lot of people's encounters with criminal justice system here. Instead of the fresh start we thought Clinton would have, it turns out Clinton's past continued to follow him. This wasn't the feel-good story we thought we had at the beginning. At this point, we weren't sure if he would be transported to Alabama to serve more time. That day in court was the last time I saw him. 
All right, well, it's Monday. I'm here at the Washington County Detention Center. We are here to visit Clinton. We wanted to bring a camera in. It didn't work out for rules and regulations. Actually, they said that he was a dangerous prisoner, and so that's the reason why we can't go in with the camera. But I did talk to him for 20 minutes, just a normal visit, and he didn't really give me too much more information than what I already knew from his mom, from his public defender, Matt Bender, but I did find out that he is not sure if he's going to Alabama or not. I like Clinton Albright. I like his personality. I like how he finds humor in all things. Will that all change in jail? I don't know. I really hope not. At the end of the day, I wish the best for him. I want him to find success. Crossing paths with him changed my perspective on not only homelessness, but some of the people living behind bars. I think that life is like film. It has beginning, climax and resolution. We try to write a perfect script for our life, but we cannot predict some of our inner and external conflicts that shape our story. Aggressive, get in front of it kind of city uh, and and we tend not to be a, a lag behind let's wait till somebody else figures it out kind of city if you want to support and 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 embrace compassionate Fayetteville then you best support and, uh, and embrace compassion when it comes to your brothers and sisters who have nothing and, and are living in third world conditions in South Fayetteville Well, usually they ask for a deposit and first and last month's rent. And the deposit is usually the same amount as the monthly rent. So if you have a 480 apartment, you have a 480 deposit and the 480 for last month. So all those 480s is about 13 to 1400 dollars, and I make half of that. What unfortunately we find is that in Northwest Arkansas, uh, there's not enough resources for uh, emergency shelter or transition uh, shelter, if you will, uh, to take people, to give them a place to get out of the woods um, and begin to work on the problems and then put them into permanent housing. I was in the street without a tent, without a blanket, without a pillow for 11 days when I was first homeless, and nobody cared. Nobody lifted a finger. So I don't want anybody to feel like that. So I got more tents than I need for people who doesn't have a place to stay.
southwest Arkansas in the Saratoga area. When I was 12, my mom died. We moved to Mineral Springs area. I went to high school, graduated Mineral Springs. It's really important that, that cities begin to look at their emergency shelter plan uh, and ask the question, it's a hard question, but ask the question, are we doing everything that we possibly can do to accommodate the complexity and diversity of our homeless population? Uh, and if the answer is no, then I think the, the, the next step is, well, what do we need to do? You know, I, th I think it's important to realize that um, in, in issues of homelessness, um, they are complex. And it requires um, cities, it requires nonprofit organizations, it requires, in this case, the university, uh, it requires uh, churches, it requires businesses, it requires community leaders uh, to work together. Um, and so I, I think everyone has a place to contribute. I think everyone has a, a role to play. Um, they have some of the biggest barriers to access the services. One thing is housing. There's a lot of things that they have to go through. I mean, we can give them the resources to where they can go to get housing, but there's a list, and the list is pretty long. And so it takes a long time. So while they're waiting, other things happen. But housing is really hard to obtain in Northwest Arkansas if you're homeless. My name is Joy Honeycutt. I'm the Section 8 Housing Specialist for the Fayetteville Housing Authority. The Section 8 program has an 18 to 24 month wait before we can assist them. So if they're homeless, that's really difficult because where are they going to do for that meantime? So we have other programs like our public housing has a shorter wait of three to nine months. But again, if they're a single person, our one bedrooms are limited and there's not a lot of turnover. So it could take a year to year and a half to even house them in a one bedroom. In order to really start to resolve any issues that may be um, continuing to keep someone in a state of homelessness, uh, we first need to provide a, a, a safe place to be, a place where they can be clean, a place where uh, they can have a roof over their head and be protected from the elements. In Fayetteville, with it being a college town the way it is, one bedrooms are hard to come by here when school's in especially. And finding them within around the range of 450 to you know maybe up to 480, if they have to pay their own utilities, um, which most of the time they do, that's difficult. So the goal then was to, to develop a, a program, and maybe it's not a housing first, I'd like to think it's shelter first, that takes someone out of this horrible third world living condition and puts them into a community environment where they have a private, secure, safe, clean, sanitary uh, shelter that is their own. The idea behind New, New Beginnings was really um, how do we provide uh, another step um, or an easier step from someone out of, out of a, a tent uh, into something safe, secure, dry, stable, um, so that they can be connected back with services and, and honestly, you know, be, begin uh, hopefully to get back on their feet. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the goal is that they would move out of those places, um, that they would become uh, fully independent, uh, contributing members of society, um, and, and do that in a way of, of, of dignity. 
My name is Shauna Hammond. I work at the University of Arkansas Community Design Center, and I am a project architect and an instructor there. And I was the architect on this project. So there's 20 cabins that are connected by kind of boardwalks, and there's community gardens. We also created an area, a pendant area, where it's more of a dog park, so the dogs can run around. And then the porch itself, and that has a screened room on it. It has bathrooms, bathrooms and showers combined, one for, uh, for each gender. And then there is uh, two offices, and then the kitchen with a warming tent. If we're really successful with new beginnings, uh, we'll eliminate the need for these kind of shelters. So informal housing is premised on the idea that they're much needed at this point, but if we mount the social services in connection with the sheltering services that we need, uh, we can begin to permanently address the homeless uh, crisis that we have. Specific part of their bigger vision. We've met with the fire chief, uh, we've talked to uh, countless organizations around the country that are doing uh, the micro shelter projects. We feel like, you know, due diligence on our part has, has been completed. We would be surprised if there was anything but a positive recommendation by the commission. scrutiny is from a neighborhood or a community that says oh, we don't want any more in uh, of, of this in our backyard then our response is but there's really nothing to attend to what's going on right now you need to let us have a chance to show you that this is the kind of program that can work 
no other comments. We have a motion from Commissioner Johnson and a second from uh, Commissioner Noble. Mr. Garner, will you please call the roll? No, yes. Mr. Garner? Yes. Hoffman? Yes. Glenn? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Niederman? Yes. Brown? Yes. Motion passes. The city of Fayetteville, uh, especially within the Planning Commission, has already uh, granted us a, a temporary permit by which we can take this project and move forward. So we've been working very closely with the city of Fayetteville. We've been working very closely with the university. Um, and we feel like maybe for the first time in a very long time, all the places um, or all the pieces are in place um, to actually bring a solution uh, in a way that we feel like would be most effective uh, in helping the people that need to be helped. And while we continue to wait on, on decision about the property as, as the city and the University of Arkansas uh, work to figure it out, um, on, on the really exciting side is, is that we have uh, the, just the greatest group of architects that we could possibly be working with. Uh, and, and Shauna Hammond, who's been, been kind of running point for the Community Design Center, just delivered the, this morning uh, a set of uh, preliminary drawings uh, and uh, is finalizing the construction drawings. We designed it so that uh, it's temporary and mobile, uh, but yet it serves complex uh, user needs. We've componentized the parts. Uh, first of all, new beginnings, it starts with 20 A-frame cabins, uh, about 140 square feet, that could be put under the, a wooded area. And that's, that's really important because uh, homeless populations seek invisibility. So it's not, not about using homes to define a public space. We look at the kind of context that homeless populations need and require. So the homes fit under a nice wooded canopy, uh, which means they need to be flexible. But at the street edge, we make what's called a community porch, which is a large platform, more or less an infrastructure that can house warming tents for kitchens, uh, bathrooms and showers, meeting areas for consultants and social workers to visit the site and, and deliver social services, as well as a meeting area and other miscellaneous uses. I've been to the planning meetings, I've heard the neighbors and their concerns, and some of them are very legitimate, and even being here today, you can see a lot of the trash and stuff that's on the property. Um, but I think, I think part of what people need to understand is that the new beginnings, part of what they're doing is providing services, and some of the services that could get provided is job training. And some of that job training could be cleaning up and working with the city and other folks to um, learn how to, you know, mitigate streams and these other areas. And so it's poten it potentially could turn into this beautiful thing where the whole property gets kind of cleaned up by the very people who live here. I believe that um, uh, the, the pathway to solving this problem is, is right in front of us. Uh, as, as, as this initiative moves forward, um, it, it won't because, be because of Serve Northwest Arkansas, it won't be because of one person, it'll be because this community is doing what this community does best. Um, and that's provide for each other, care for each other, collaborate with each other um, in, in the desire to, to, to really make this community everything that, that it is and it is becoming and will become. And so um, it's going to take everybody to do it um, and we're, we're excited to see where this goes. Here's what we're doing with New Beginnings. It's not just a project for Fayetteville. Uh, we're designing it so it could be a prototype for the nation uh, because the entire nation has not only a crisis with homelessness, but it hasn't come to grips with informal housing. And what we're trying to show with New Beginnings is that informal housing can not only serve really critical needs, but also uh, can be an uplifting place. Uh, it can express community in a way that formal housing and uh, formal homeless shelters have not. This could be a prototype 
that all communities can build because right now most of these uh, transition communities happen in an ad hoc way. They happen in a guerrilla mm -hmm. format and what we're trying to show is that with design thinking uh, we can not only serve fundamental needs but we can also elevate the quality of the community so that it gives back to the larger neighborhood that it's in. So it can be a community of choice, a community with pride, and a community that, that projects and uh, expresses dignity. Yeah, and helping others. So I think it's a great way for Where we are right uh, now is that those construction drawings should be completed. Kathy Hall, who is the uh, Agri Industrial Arts teacher at, at uh, Central Junior High in Springdale, uh, will begin working on those plans with her students and a couple of other teachers who have other classes and hopefully we'll start having a couple of build days. Saturdays where the kids can come, parents can come, teachers, the principals already uh, gotten engaged. This is a win-win, right? This is a win for New Beginnings, but it's a win for the community uh, that's willing to take on this kind of a, of a project. And once we have that prototype finished, uh, begin to, to use that prototype uh, as a way to communicate the message of, of what we're trying to accomplish. People have to realize that homeless people are citizens too. This here is just like the craziest experience I've ever had to deal with in my life. Are we doing everything that we possibly can do to accommodate the complexity and diversity of our homeless population? Hello and welcome to the campus of the University of Arkansas and our new television studio here inside the Sue Walk Burnett Center for Journalism and Student Media. I'm Larry Foley and tonight we are going to focus on a topic that's not easy to discuss or frankly even think about at times, homelessness. Here in Northwest Arkansas, our economy is booming. We're consistently rated as one of the very best places in the entire country to live and work. But in the midst of our prosperity, we've got a problem. We also have a growing homeless population and the issue has no easy solutions. No one on our campus has studied this topic more thoroughly than Dr. Kevin Fitzpatrick, a university professor and director of the Community and Family Institute. Kevin, homelessness, how has that kind of become your academic and to a large degree sort of your personal focus for uh, quite a number of years? Well, it started when I was uh, in Birmingham uh, nearly uh, 30 years ago uh, and became part of a, a, not only a group of advocates, but a group of researchers who, who did the first point in time census in Birmingham 
And uh, we continued that through uh, for nearly 20 years. And, and then when I moved here in 2005, continued that work uh, to start the first point in time census in 2007. And we've been uh, recording and keeping an eye on that over the last 10 years. How much of a problem is this? We see more homeless folks than we saw a few years ago. Is this really a big issue that we're dealing with in, in Northwest Arkansas? It is. Uh, when we combine both the visible and the invisible numbers of homeless in uh, Northwest Arkansas, including just Washington and Benton County, uh, the last count that we did was 2,951. Uh, of which over 50% uh, of those uh, were actually K through 12 students. Uh, a very invisible part of the population, not the, the population that we're always seeing on the street corner uh, or that are camping in the woods, but, but an important part of the story. And it's a complex ease, uh, issue. It doesn't have any real simple solutions. Uh, we can't just put a homeless person in a box and say, that's who they are. Yeah, yeah. I think well, that uh, part of it has to do with the fact that uh, every one of them come with a different story, uh, and uh, it's not a, a shotgun approach. We'll take care of everybody. Um, there's so many different problems and issues that that this population faces that uh, it wouldn't be no surprise then that uh, we wouldn't be able to come up with one single housing solution. Joining us now is a panel of folks who work with the homeless including Charlene Fields of Souls Harbor in Benton County, Captain Josh Robinette of the Salvation Army of Northwest Arkansas, and Solomon Birchfield of Seven Hills Day Center in Fayetteville. Uh, Charlene, let's begin with you. What does Souls Harbor do? Who are you serving? So Souls Harbor is a men's transitional living program. We serve 20 men ages 18 to 65 who are in recovery. Um, next year we'll actually celebrate 30 years located in Rogers, so we're not new. And um, they participate in life skills classes. We have a 90-day program. They can graduate in as little as four months, and they can stay with us up to a year. Our capacity right now, we're, we're housing anywhere from 120 to 150 people every night at the Salvation Army. Uh, in addition to that, we have a drug and alcohol rehab program with 20 beds, four of those designated for uh, graduates who are going to be transitioning out. Um, in addition to those things, we fed over 106,000 people last year, or 106,000 meals, I guess I should say. Um, and then we, we also administer what we call homeless prevention services, helping individuals who uh, need help with their utilities, rent, something like that that would prevent them from falling into being, becoming homeless. Solomon Seven Hills, here in Fayetteville, we know of Seven Hills. You have the day center and you provide some assistance, I guess, camping uh, things for, for people who, who unfortunately have to live in the woods. Talk to us a little bit about your work at Seven Hills. Yeah, Seven Hills has been around for over 15 years now. And we generally step in when someone is experiencing homelessness to try to uh, help meet their basic needs. It's meals, showers, clothing, uh, ability to talk with a social worker and get connected to community resources. We do that for about 2,000 people over the calendar year. And then we also offer a couple housing programs that are uh, short-term interventions that will help people transition out of homelessness into stable housing and move on with their lives. We serve about 60 people um, right now in our various housing programs. Now, Kevin, you know all these folks, and you know how hard they work and, and what a hard task uh, this is. It, it seems like it must be like trying to push a, an 800-pound uh, boulder up a hill. Uh, are they making a difference? Well, I, they definitely are making a difference because I think one of the things that, that either you saw in the movies tonight or that you heard from, uh, from folks that uh, there's not just one population and there's not just one way of addressing uh, the issues that are that are, that are pushing on this population, they're, they're all over the board. And, and each one of these service providers uh, have, a, have a, a unique task. They share a lot uh, in terms of, of their responsibilities. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that uh, um, the way our world looks, particularly in Northwest Arkansas, would look way different if we didn't have the, the kind of work that these guys are doing and, and uh, the way they're supporting the population. 
Uh, Charlene, some of these stories that we saw tonight and, and some of the stories involving people who are homeless, they're heartbreaking. Yes. Uh, but there are success stories too. You must see them at, at Sills Harbor. Yes, we see tremendous success. Um, right now our success rate is 33%. The national average is between 9 and 11. And so we've been able to serve them, offer them life skills. They've gained gainful employment, not just employment, but gainful, successful employment. And that they found safe, stable housing that they can afford. Um, and so that, to me, is success. The population that we work with is very diverse. And um, we see a lot of success as well. I, we had 17 men graduate our program last year. Today are living sober, productive lives. Um, I think, now we provided over 24,000 nights of shelter last year. And uh, while that's a big number, there's a, there's a smaller number that I tend to tell folks about more often. And it was a, the number's 183. 183 people transitioned out of our shelters into housing uh, in 2017. And so uh, that tells us that what we're doing and what we're doing collaboratively is working. It's making a difference. Uh, do we have our work cut out for us? You betcha. But, but what we're doing matters. I studied religion in school. And I worked with people who had developmental disabilities while I studied religion. And for me, that really reshaped who I am and how I see people in the world. And it led me to seek out uh, the kind of job where you get to serve your fellow human being. And this is one of those jobs where um, you'd better be in it for the purpose and the difference that you can make in the community. Um, you would better have a team around you that helps keep your compassion alive um, and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. And it doesn't hurt to have a community around you that is really supportive that really encourages, I think all of us would say our community really encourages the nonprofits that are working with people and really resources us so that we can fulfill our missions effectively. You know, we typically expect to see it in, in Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles, but, but I think that it's, it's, created a new, it's created a new conversation in, in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, uh, whatever you do, don't look away. Um, look somebody in the face even if it makes you ask tough questions about yourself or about your community. Um, a lot of people who are homeless miss out on people treating them with dignity, mm -hmm. um, smiling at them, engaging them in a normal conversation. Uh, I think if you meet that person on the street corner, that's the place to begin. It may not be the place to end, but at the very least, look at someone, talk with someone, learn their story like these filmmakers did. Um, and let that inform how you show up in your community going forward. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things also that, and, and I know that they've talked about this uh, in the past as well, is that we've, we saw movies tonight and, and, and really the, the, all three of these service providers are, are working with a pretty visible population. Uh, they, they are maybe the ones that are standing on the corner. They are the ones that we see moving back and forth. Uh, but there's a, there's a large population in Northwest Arkansas, as there is in the rest of the country, that, is, that are very invisible. Um, share, donations are down. Um, it's not, you know, this next year won't be quite the write-off, correct? Um, if you donate a, you know, less than amount. Um, and so I've noticed that. And so we've decided how can we have a sustainable revenue without relying so much on donors. Um, and for souls, we're actually going to be a clinic. So we're going to offer substance abuse treatments on site and open that to the public, which is a huge need. Um, and, you know, offer it at a federal sliding fee scale. So we're not just serving those who are insured, you know, and we took down that barrier. Um, but other ways where we can have a steady revenue source um, so that we're not so reliant on donations. But, yeah, that's, all, that's always a challenge, um, working with people who are some of the poorest of the poor. Um, and then how do you keep the lights on in, the, in your organization? Mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge. We have a generous uh, base of donors. We have a generous community. Um, part of Seven Hills funding model is a federal grants that pro you know, provide housing programs um, that help people get their feet back under them. But, but it's definitely always a challenge. Uh, they all have, as you said, a, a heavy boulder to push. And uh, they all tell great stories. And, and this community just needs to continue to support them and, and embrace the, the fact that, that we can change this, even if it's one person 
one life at a time.